Hi everybody and welcome to the FameLab International Semi-Finals for 2021. I am very, very excited to be here and this is the first semi-final. This has been organised by the lovely folk at Cheltenham Festivals in partnership with the British Council. And if you haven't come across the British Council before, it's the UK's international organisation for cultural relations and educational opportunities. I've worked with them loads uh, all over the world and they are really, really fantastic. My name is Emer Maguire, I'm a BBC radio presenter, I'm a science communicator of course, and I'm a musical comedian, and most importantly, I am your host for today. I won the UK, the UK Fame Lab way back in 2015, so I am delighted to be back this year with hosting. Uh, since we are working across different time zones here, this is pre-recorded, but I need to remind you the whole way through, the chat is very, very much live. So please write in it throughout, comment, let us know who you like and why, where you're tuning in from. We really, really want to give our finalists a little bit of support through the chat. And we are hoping to meet people from all over the world. So do get typing. So let's get to it. What is FameLab? Let's find out. FameLab is the leading science communication competition and training program in the world. Each year, thousands of researchers from across the globe receive training and then compete in heats. FameLab was created by Cheltenham Science Festival and is delivered globally in partnership with the British Council, making science accessible for all. FameLabbers have three minutes to capture their audience. Three judges judge them on the three C's of FameLab. Content, clarity, and charisma. And you, the audience, vote for your favorite too. Each country crowns their national champion, and those national champions come together to compete for the title of FameLab International Champion. FameLab participants have gone on to present TV shows, give TED Talks, publish books, and so much more. FameLab is all about giving skills, confidence, and opportunities to scientists, engineers, and mathematicians to communicate their current research with the people that it impacts. Absolutely incredible. FameLab was created by the Cheltenham Festivals way back in 2005, and the British Council has been the international partner since 2007. And over the past 15 years, over 40 countries have taken part in FameLab, and I just think that is such an incredible feat. FameLab looks for the world's most talented science communicators. There are no slides, no scripts, no animations, just minimal props and stacks of charisma. Participants have got three minutes to win us over with a scientific talk using the three C's, content, clarity, and charisma. So we started with literally thousands of participants, people who've taken part in countless training sessions, regional heats, national finals all around the world. And the national finalists have even more training at master classes in science communication. And we are now down to just 23 country champions, but only 10 are gonna go through to the final. And today we have got the 11 finalists representing their countries as part of the first semi-final. Five people from this one will go on and take part in the grand final overall. Four chosen by the three judges, as I say, and one chosen by you, but more about that later. So let's go ahead and meet our judges. We have got three judges who have the incredibly difficult, but hopefully very rewarding job of choosing our winners. They bring together the perfect blend of international public engagement experience, research expertise, and of course, science communication skills. I'm gonna let each judge introduce themselves. And I wanna to go to Madeline first. So Madeline, tell us about yourself and what you'll be looking for in today's participants. Thanks, Emma. Well, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be a judge for this semi-final. Um, so I'm Madeline Howard. I'm the Global Information Security Coordinator at SAGE. I'm also director and chair of Cyber Cheltenham, which is the UK's largest cyber cluster. For me, I'm looking for passion and personality. I think it's really important that we can see the individual behind this amazing research and work that you've done and really enjoy the process. Um, it's, it's so wonderful to see 
participants who really are passionate about what they're delivering and also believe in the work that they've done. And I think, as you're saying, their passion and personality are some of the key qualities of FameLab every year. So hopefully this year won't be any different. Uh, we are going to head next over to Claire. So Claire, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're looking for in today's participants. Thanks, Ema. So I'm Claire McNulty. I'm currently the director for Europe for National Geographic Society, but I've actually been involved in FameLab in one way or another for more than 10 years now, so I am super happy to be one of the judges for this semi-final. I love FameLab every time I learn something new. Um, and what I'm looking for today is I'm really looking for science storytellers. I want someone to tell me a story, to bring me on the journey with them and to captivate me with, with what they teach me. Um, so I can't wait to hear the semi-finalists. Brilliant Claire, thank you so much. So we've got passion, personality and science storytellers as well, which is the perfect combination for science communication. And our final judge is the absolutely brilliant Kai. So Kai, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you are looking for in today's participants. Um, so glad to be here. Um, love Fame Lab, love the three C's. Um, my name is Kai Mamahanafia and I'm a senior lecturer at um, University of Science Malaysia but currently I'm doing my secondment at Burnett Institute in Melbourne, so it's, it's, why it's dark here right now. Um, my <laughs> research interest is infectious disease. Um, and what I'm looking for today is, I want to forget I'm listening to a science communication talk, but I want to learn something new. Um, that's basically it. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. I think I think the, the learning something new and kind of going outside of your area is a massive thing, a massive part of FameLab and it was one of my favourite experiences whenever I was involved with FameLab. Um, something that was talked about a lot when I was part of FameLab were the three C's and the importance of them. So Claire, I want to ask you, what do the three C's mean to you? Absolutely, yeah, three C's are crucial. It's content, clarity, charisma. So content, we're looking for good science, good accurate science that's up to date. Clarity, do we understand it? Could we then go and explain it to our next door neighbor afterwards? And charisma, it's hard sometimes to judge charisma, but for me it's really about, is someone keeping me hanging on their every word? Do I want them to continue when that buzzer goes at the end of three minutes? Um, it's hard to quantify, but when you see it, you know it. That's perfect. And those things are so important in science communication. And you know, you said about being able to explain it to your neighbour. I always think if you can take someone's topic and explain it to your granny, then you've, you've kind of done your job perfectly. Um, Madeline, obviously we're at the international semi-final and our finalists are all presenting in English. And for so many of our finalists, if not all of our finalists, English is not their first language. So obviously there's an additional pressure there. They're doing an incredible job with that additional pressure. What will you think is kind of the secret ingredient to get through that pressure today? And what is the main thing you're really looking for? Well, I think, you know, we're not judging English. Um, that's that's important that we, we say that from the outset. But I think, you know, the three C's, it's about a whole package here. We want to be left you know, wanting more, wanting to Google more, wanting to look for more. Um, don't worry about the extra pressure. We just want to see a, a presentation which flows, which has fantastic content, it's clear, and it has an amazing um, charisma. So please don't worry about the English. Um, I'm terrible at English. I probably can't speak it properly myself. Um, so please just enjoy. It's going to be an amazing experience. 100%. Thank you, Madeline. Um, and finally, Kai. We know that you were the international winner in 2018 with an absolutely incredible talk. So do you have, from your experience, any kind of top tip for the participants today? Not really, <laughs> but I will say, <laughs> don't forget to breathe. That's, that's really important. <laughs> that's a good one, yeah. That is a very, very good one. I think, um, you know, that, that's the first thing that you forget to do as soon as you get on stage or as soon as you get on Zoom. Everyone's going to take a big deep breath just before we get started. So that is that is how you win FameLab, by continuing to remember to breathe. A very important part of your talk. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk about the voting because we've got our brilliant judges who decide who gets through to the grand final. 
But once you have heard everyone's talk, you're also going to be able to vote for your favourite presenter. Um, the audience is very important to us. We would love you to be part of today. And the link to vote is on screen now. We're very, very high tech. There's also a QR code and a link has been posted in the chat. So be ready to vote once all of the participants have spoken. You're going to have 24 hours to vote for your favourite. Please remember to do it. We would love to know what you think at home. Uh, but now, without further ado, let's introduce our first participant. And I am very, very excited to introduce Jonathan, who is representing Malta. Jonathan is a maths and physics graduate. He is studying electromagnetism in the biomedical field. And I cannot wait to hear his talk. So first up, please welcome Jonathan. Cancer. I know, you heard enough about it. But trust me, I have something more to tell you. Now, before I go rambling on, what is cancer in the first place? Simply put, it is a genetic disease which involves the uncontrollable growth of some of the body cells, which then spread to other regions of the body. These cells continue to grow uncontrollably and they do not die when they are supposed to. This interferes with the usual functioning of the body and can cause a variety of symptoms and complications. The most common treatment is to surgically remove the cancerous tumour by cutting it out, which is then usually followed by either chemo or radiotherapy, or a mix of both. Now, cancer may crop up almost anywhere inside the body, but my focus for today is to discuss with you how existing breast cancer therapy can be improved. And the main idea is hyperthermia, where a localized region of the body is heated up to around 45 degrees Celsius, where the malignant or bad cells are located. This does not kill the bad cells, but it inhibits the DNA repair mechanism. As a consequence, lower doses of chemo or radiotherapy are required, which potentially reduces the damage done to healthy surrounding tissue. In addition, more oxygen is supplied to the tumour, which enhances blood circulation and in turn makes chemotherapy more effective. Now, this idea begs the question, how can such a heating process be achieved? What about using a microwave oven? An excellent idea, however, this poses a challenge and an excellent research question. How can we direct microwaves towards a localized region inside the body without squeezing an entire person inside a microwave oven? And the answer is antennas. Using antennas, a localized region of the body can be heated up with microwaves without affecting other areas of the body. And this is exactly what the Electromagnetics Research Group at the University of Malta is working on. Our research group embarked on an innovative project called Hyper4B, which aims at designing an antenna system which would be capable of achieving hyperthermia inside a localized region within the breast. The project also involves testing the system via experimentation and multiple computational simulations. All of these efforts would hopefully significantly enhance existing breast cancer treatment because unfortunately it is the leading cause of cancer death amongst women worldwide. Thank you. Well done Jonathan, absolutely fantastic. Really, really good. Um, what a topic to start on. That was very, very innovative. Um, and just, just l that was incredible to listen to. I love that. My kind of area is anatomy and, and biomedical as well so that was I, I found that absolutely fascinating and I'm very keen to hear what the judges thought about it so first up we are going to go to Claire. Claire do you have a question for Jonathan? Yeah absolutely thanks Jonathan that was super interesting I had not heard of that before. Um, is this technique of hyperthermia being used in any clinical trials at the moment um, and do you know what the side effects potentially could be? Yes, it's already being used. In fact, it, it can be used in other treatments as well, not just the breast cancer therapy, not just radiotherapy and chemotherapy, because since it enhances, one of the effects is oxygenation of the site and enhances blood circulation, it enhances any drug uptake. So 
it can be used in multiple, in conjunction with multiple other therapies. It's good to know that it's sort of as a side therapy with other therapies. It's never used on its own. So hyperthermia on its own won't achieve anything because its main feature is to enhance the drug uptake. So yeah, it is actually already being used. And, and any side effects? Not that I'm aware of it. Since my area is physics, I am not really, really up to date, but not that I am aware of. Doesn't mean that there couldn't be any, of course. Perfect, thank you, Jonathan. And I think we'll go to Kai next. Kai, if you have a question. Yeah, I actually, Claire, you took the question I was thinking of, because whenever there's a new treatment, <laughs> I'm always wondering what's, you know, what's the catch here, what's the limitation, but um, since um, it's not, it's so, so new, I'm just wondering, what about the cost effectiveness? Do you, do you have any comments about whether this is something that's um, quite affordable or will that be a limitation? Well, in tandem with the other question, I can also comment that it shouldn't be prolonged for a very long time since you are increasing body temperature. However, the more localized it is, the more prolonged you can increase the body temperature because if you were to increase the body temperature to 45 degrees Celsius all around the body, that would be a problem because our usual body temperature is around 37 degrees. But since it is very localized, there shouldn't be many side effects. So that's one thing. And the other question, can you repeat? A bit your question, please. Yeah. Like the like the cost is it is it a very expensive um, method to apply? Depending on the way you do it, probably. For example, our research group is designing an antenna system, so the designing phase, the materials needed, etc., would be a bit expensive. But once the antenna is you know designed and being used, it shouldn't be very much expensive because all is required is to use the antenna for a short period of time to heat the tissue while the, the the other treatment is in progress. So it shouldn't be very much cost costly. Thank you, Jonathan. And we are gonna go quickly for our last question to Madeline, please. Thanks, Jonathan. I thought that was fantastic. I actually watched something yesterday about um, breast cancer awareness and it spoke about how men can also get breast cancer, which I had no idea about. I was wondering, gee, is this being trialed in men? Is there plans for it to be trialed in men or is it typically just at the moment being trialed with women? As far as, I'm, as I am aware, no, because the incidence rate is obviously much, much lower in men. But yes, I have I had read, in fact, myself that Sometimes it can be incident in men, but the incidence rate is much, much lower. It's obviously far more prevalent in women. So the, the focus for now is women, of course. Thank you so, so much. Um, and really interesting questions as well. And, and nice to bring that point up at the end. Madeline, of course, um, men, I think in the UK, it's maybe about 400 men a year. So it's, it's not as common as women, obviously, but uh, it's, it's, it's common enough. So that's really, really interesting and a very, very exciting area as well, Jonathan. So I want to say thank you so much for your brilliant talk and thank you to the judges. That's all we've got time for with your questions. So that's it. That's how it works. Jonathan has been our first uh, of many today and next up we have got Fatima who is representing Qatar and Fatima is a student who is studying physics and astrophysics so let's welcome Fatima. If you want to find aliens don't look on Mars instead look on Enceladus. Many scientists think that the best chance of finding life somewhere other than Earth in our solar system is a certain planet's moon. Enceladus is a tiny moon orbiting Saturn, and its surface is made up of frozen water. And below this crust of frozen water is a liquid ocean. It's covered in ice, and scientists think that shell of ice is 10 to 15 miles thick. And that ice is floating on a liquid ocean 40 to 100 miles deep. For context, the deepest part of Earth's ocean, the Mariana Trench, is seven miles deep. There it is compared to how deep Enceladus's ocean is. So not only is it liquid ice, but it's half ice and perhaps even a place for primitive life. So liquid water? Check. Do you ever feel like, ugh, math, I'll never use this in real life? Well, what if you could use it to find life on another world? What's so exciting about Enceladus is that this moon shoots out huge plumes of water into space. And when NASA flew the Cassini probe through one of these plumes, it sniffed the plume and detected methane, 
a lot of methane. On Earth, methane can come from geological or biological sources. But at this moment, diving under the surface of Enceladus to see what's down there isn't really an option. But you know what is an option? Math. Researchers actually found that there is a chance of life being on this world. Their calculations showed that even at their highest output, non-living sources could not account for the sheer amounts of methane they were seeing. When they ran the equations with methogenic organisms, that is what could account for the amount of methane they were seeing. Now, by no means were they definitely saying they've discovered life on another world, but just maybe math helped us find new life forms. So, unique chemistry? Check! All the pieces are now falling into place. Liquid water? Check. Unique chemistry? Check. But what about an energy source? Enceladus actually has loads of craters or holes on its surface, but only on half of it. For example, the South Pole has these cool marks that literally look like tiger stripes. This is a sign of major volcanic action, which means it's geologically active, which means energy source? Check! So with its global ocean, unique chemistry, and internal heat, Enceladus has become a very promising lead in our search for worlds where life could exist. This giant snowball has become the target for NASA's next missions, amazingly named ELF and ELSA. So who would have thought a giant snowball at the edge of our solar system could be where life possibly exists? A little trap face I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Fatima. That was incredible. As soon as you started, I love anything space science related. So I just love that from the start. And I feel like check is going to be in my head all day. Um, you know what? It, you know what is an option? Math is definitely just going to be a phrase that I'm using now. Uh, so that was brilliant. Thank you so much. So fascinating. And you really, really do learn so much new uh, in FameLab. That was fantastic. So I want to go to the judges to see what they thought. And I'm going to go to Kai first. So Kai, I'll give you the first question. Thanks for that talk. Yeah, I'm with Emma here. Um, I love a good space talk, and it's it's so like a coincidence that I'm actually reading Cosmos by uh, right now. So a lot of this is like making me really excited. But one of the things that I remember reading um, is how uh, Carl Sagan thinks that if there is in fact life um, anywhere uh, else, whether it be a moon or a planet, then we shouldn't go there anymore it now belongs to them. So for example, if we found bacteria on Mars, it now belongs to the Martian bacteria. And, and so I wonder what you think about that. Like what do we do if we actually do discover that um, there is some form of life um, on um, anywhere else um, other than Earth? That is a question that many people do have divided opinions upon, uh, on, but I'm of the opinion that I feel like if there is life, shouldn't we at least try to dis to at least explore and learn from it, um, it wouldn't do us any good to just separate or isolate ourselves. So if there is life, no matter how primitive it is, maybe we could, without harming it, of course, but just explore the possibility that we could maybe learn, take samples, and just learn more about this new species, which has pro we've probably never seen before. So, yeah, that's what I think. Thank you so much, Fatima. And I, I think that's, you know, what science is all about, exploring a little bit outside ourselves and a little bit more so we can we can learn more about everything around us as well. So um, that was a that was a lovely answer. I'm going to go to Madeline. What do you think? I mean, I thought that was fantastic. Again, I love anything space related. Um, Fatima, you're clearly very passionate, but I'd like to know where, where does that passion stem from and, and where, where did you get your inspiration to kind of take this project forward? Um, it all just started when I start, picked up a space science book when I was about six years old and I just saw the cool little planets and I was like, oh wow, that's really cool. And then I took physics and I was like, oh, I like math. I'm good at math. And now I, I'm currently an astrophysics student and I get to take observational cosmology, introduction to astrophysics, and it's just so cool learning about the universe and knowing that there's a whole world out there that could be discovered, and we've only discovered a fraction of it. And I just feel like it's so fascinating and that there's so much more to be learned. 
from topics ranging from astrobiology to quantum mechanics to astrophysics. It all just, it's very exciting to learn. And I think that kind of excitement and passion is definitely, definitely coming through. Uh, Farama, Claire, what about you for our final question? Fatima, that was fantastic. Um, and what I really want to know is, you know, we've been talking about alien life for probably a hundred years now. And we're seeing different bits of the puzzle coming through. You talked about water, you talked about methane. What will be the definitive piece of evidence, the final piece of the puzzle that allows us to say, yes, there is alien life out there? Um, if we, if all of these pieces of the puzzle are already in place, then I feel like a sure sign would be um, what we call biosignatures. So if we identify some um, chemical or biological markers that could signal the presence of like organic macromolecules on that planet, I feel like that could be a definitive sign. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and, and a big thank you again to Fatima. That was absolutely incredible. Um, so two brilliant talks so far. And now we have got medical student uh, Murilina, who is representing Romania. She told us uh, whenever she was 22, she fell in love with the art of explanation. And I thought that was a beautiful thing to say. Um, she wants to become a professor so, a professor so she can communicate science for a living. And she wants FameLab to be her perfect starting point. So let's welcome Modelina. One thing all of us have in common is that we've probably seen at least one movie about a person stuck in a time loop. Reliving the same depressing day might not be this, that fictional after all, because that is how some clinically depressed patients describe their condition. This lack of hope is one of the many symptoms that uh, clinically depressed patients have, along with persistent unhappiness, feeling worthless, losing interest in the things they enjoyed, or even having recurrent thoughts about death or even suicide. These symptoms interfere with day-to-day -day activities and lead to an overall feeling that life just isn't enjoyable. However, in all time loop movies, there is a loophole and we are here to find it because you see today we were trusted with a mission to deliver one important message all the way from Cluj-Napoca, Romania to Chatham, UK. This kind of traveling of information also happens in your brain. It uses neurons, which are these weird looking cells that connect different parts of the brain and are responsible for emotions, perceptions and thoughts. We begin our journey by taking the electric car all the way to the synaptic sea. But cars can't swim, so now we need a boat. In our brain, these boats are called neurotransmitters and they include serotonin, noradrenaline and dopamine. We take the boat, but on the other shore, there aren't enough ports or receptors for all of us. The sea gets crowded, so the pirate police comes and they either, one, convince us to re-enter the continent through special reuptake ports, or two, they use little bombs called monamine oxidases to destroy the ships. However, if any of those two actions is blocked in a depressed patient, uh, if any of those two actions is blocked in a depressed patient, uh, the neurotransmitter concentration in the synapse will increase and the depression symptoms will diminish. This is how the famous Prozac works. It blocks the serotonin reuptake ports, hence uh, the name selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. We, uh, we finally reached uh, Chaldenham and we can finally share our message with the world. Clinical depression is a real illness and it, uh, it can lead to people dying. Every 40 seconds, one person commits suicide. This... There is still hope because scientists are still working on new ways to improve the treatment options and things like deep brain stimulation might be the future. So
So keep this in mind and I will leave you with this quote by Dr. Who. In 900 years of time and space, I have never met anyone who wasn't important. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Um, I really, really love that. Very, very important topic. A topic that lots of people will be will be familiar with. Um, I used to work clinically in neurology and that is an area that I am very, very passionate about. So I'm delighted that someone has talked about it today. Um, and I don't think I've ever heard a better description of neurons than weird looking cells that are responsible for your emotions. So that was brilliant and the props were absolutely fantastic. So I am gonna go for my first question to Madeline. Perfect, thank you. I mean, I loved the props and the explanation. I thought that was a f fantastic way to, to get to get your message across. I'd really like to know though, what, what does the future of um, treatment for clinical depression look like off the back of research like this, Madalena? So we can talk about deep brain stimulation, which means uh, doctors implant an electrode inside your brain that fires and that disrupts the circuit of depression. And uh, recently, they actually tried it with two electrodes, one that senses when it should fire and one that actually fires. And this is really recent in October. It was published in October this year and it was really effective. And even the deep brain stimulation using only one electrode was really effective because people said that they don't live in the fog anymore and they, they they can finally see colors of life and they can finally enjoy life because before normal was just sad. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, and I think we'll go to, we'll go to Kai next. Kai looked like she was really enjoying that. So Kai, what, what's your question? Uh, firstly, I mean, I love the analogy, like the double layers of analogy, the communication breakdowns on different level. And so that kind of triggers um, my question, like under COVID, a lot of our communication amongst, you know, our loved ones, um, our friends really disrupted. Um, do you, can you comment a bit on what um, you know about uh, the impact on mental health um, uh, under COVID and, and whether you saw any um, increase in clinical depression as well? Yes, it's definitely the clinical depression increased during the COVID time because of the isolation, because of the death, because of the constant danger. And I think this is why it's so important to have this talk about depression, even though I was really, really nervous about this talk. But I think it's important that people hear about it because it's good to understand it. It's good to understand how the medicine works and it's good to understand that there is hope. They shouldn't give up. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, this is this is part of why I really love FameLab because a lot of the times people are storytelling and talking about science, but it's actually quite emotional. So Madalena saying at the end, you know, actually there is hope. I think that's quite impactful for a lot of people who've been suffering in, in lockdown. So thank you for choosing such an important topic, Madalena. Um, I'm gonna just get Claire just to finish this off with the questions here, please. Thanks, Madalena. Yeah, that was that was great. And you powered through as well. Um, you know, sometimes I've seen many, many Fame Lab um finals and semi-finals where people have frozen, but you 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 did it. You got through there, you took us with you on the journey, I think, and, and it was great to, to hear from you. So my question is really about the side effects. So you talk about this deep brain stimulation and you talked about um drugs like Prozac. Uh, you know, is do you think the future is towards the deep brain stimulation? Do you think it's going to be a combination of the two? What's going to be best for the patients in the long term? So currently, deep brain stimulation was only used in treatment resistant patients, so in patients that don't respond to classical treatment. But I think that in the future, there will be studies done on patients who don't take antidepressants and will only use uh, deep brain stimulation. But yes, I, I, I am aware of the fact that med, uh, drugs have a lot of side effects and I think deep brain stimulation is still too young to actually see if the side effects, of, if there are any side effects or if the side effects are considerable. So I think that for the near future, it's going to be a combination of both. And in the future, who knows? 
Thank you so, so much, Madalena. We really appreciate your talk. And thank you to all of the judges for their uh, fantastic, fantastic questions. Um, as, as Claire was saying there, well done on keeping going. You know, it's very, you know, it's very, very difficult whenever you kind of are, are doing a talk. It's very nerve wracking. So I would love the people who are watching um, to, to write in the chat, write encouraging things. Let us know how you think it's going. Um, and everyone who's taking part, if you, if you blip over a wee bit in the middle or, or you, you get a little bit nervous, just keep going. We're so excited to hear what you have to say. Um, so thank you so much, Madalena. Um, we are going to move on to our next speaker. And next up, we have got Latago, who is representing South Africa. And Latago is a master's student at Northwest University. And she's investigating the impact of climate change on farmers in the Mopani district. Very, very topical uh, this week particularly. Outside of research, she loved, loves life in the outdoors, very outdoorsy, and loves engaging in youth work. So please, please welcome Latago. Here is 2001. I'm on summer vacation at my grandmother's house. I step out onto the front porch of their farmstead, inhale the summer breeze, and I'm met by a lush plantation of bananas, mangoes, pineapples, avocado, and papaya, a true tropical feast. Fast forward to 2010, I step out onto that same porch, inhale the dry, <coughs> hot air, but there's no plantation in sight. This is the harsh reality of climate change. Good day, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary folk. My research looks at the impact of climate change on agriculture and smallholder farmers in the Mobani district of the Limpopo province, north of, the Lim north of South Africa. Why Mobani, you might ask? Well, this area is the agricultural hub of the province and a tropical area, making it highly susceptible to climate change as it only has two seasons, the wet and dry seasons. Now, as a geographer, I have the wonderful advantage of studying both the natural and social sciences. Key to the social aspect of my research is public perception and understanding of climate change. I believe that how well farmers perceive climate change determines how well they will adapt to it. I found that 73% of farmers in my area prefer indigenous methods passed down from generation to generation as opposed to those prescribed by the Department of Agriculture. For example, did you know that you could store maize and sweet potato in an underground pit as this preserves the food for more than one season in the case of a drought? Or that studying the behavior of insects, for example, the movement of locusts, frogs, bees, and butterflies in one direction is often an indicator of an oncoming drought. And I bet you didn't know that you could improve the moisture retention of soil in changing climates by composting the urine and excrement of cattle as manure. All of these are some of the methods that are being used in my region. And even though the significance of indigenous knowledge in agriculture is internationally recognized, it, its role in disaster risk management in South Africa is not well documented. And that is where my research comes in. I believe in science for the people, with the people. I believe that the growing recognition of indigenous knowledge shows the need to explore its significance in climate disaster um, risk reduction. And so now we're back in Mopani. The year is 2021. Climate is still changing, but I now run a sustainable, cost-effective farm with years of experience and knowledge passed down from my grandparents. I rear only the Nguni breed of cattle as they are, are resistant to the severe African drought and tolerant to disease. I promote cultural practices that encourage the planting of indigenous crops and continue to advocate for the inclusion of indigenous knowledge systems in disaster risk policy for climate change. Thank you. Well done, Latago. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Um, I didn't know that about the movement of the, the locust as an indicator of, um, of uh, an oncoming drought. I thought that was fascinating. And I loved your kind of use of science for sustainability. I thought that was incredible. Um, so I am going to go to the judges for your questions. Can't wait to hear these. Uh, I think I'll start off this time with Claire. Thanks. That was brilliant. Climate change is really close to my heart um, and in particular also indigenous knowledge. So it was really good to hear about that. Um, 
So one of the things about Indigenous knowledge is it's very context specific um, and location specific. But do you think that there are things that can be transferred and learned throughout the world? And how can we make that happen? Um, I think, like you're saying, it's very context specific. So the most important thing is understanding the environment that you're in. And the important thing about indigenous knowledge is bringing in the people that carry this knowledge. You know, this is how it makes it more effective because the people that know the land, that live on the land and work on the land are able to offer much more insights than people coming from, from institutions and industries that are not necessarily familiar with the land. So I think if that's a basic principle that we adopt throughout that you know let's bring in these people as stakeholders then that's the one way that we create policies that are going to be sustainable for the different regions brilliant thank you so much thank you um madeline what about you do you have a question for us oh, i mean i thought that was fantastic i love anything ge ge geography related um so i thought that was really really interesting you spoke a lot at the start about um the kind of public perception of climate change and that actually if, if people don't perceive that there's a problem then then policy isn't going to change and then methods won't change how do you think in the whole we can go about changing people's perception of climate change to make sure that actually it, it's perceived as a really important thing that we all need to come together on I think in the context of my research, um, the misconception would be that the elderly people or the less scientifically educated people um, are unaware of what it is. I've, what I've found throughout my research is that even though they cannot put it in scientific terms, they're very much aware that climates are changing, that rains aren't you know, coming the way they should be, or certain crops aren't growing in an area that they used to flourish in. And so with that group of people, it's very easy to understand that perhaps our communication of what climate change is is what should change which is where I guess psychom comes in because then if you're able to show people that we're not saying that there's this big black hole in the sky and you know everything is is going to ruins but context specific what have you noticed in your environment that has changed over the last few years and that's when we bring climate change back to them and we personalize it where in, in, in an area where I'm from if the highest uh, degrees used to be 27 degrees Celsius and now it's gone up to 35 degrees in the last 10 years, that's something that you begin to pinpoint to people. So I think we need to personalize and familiarize climate change um, on an everyday level. Thank you, Latago. And we are just going to go for a super quick question with a super quick answer uh, to Kai, please, to finish off. Great talk. Um, love the topic. Can you tell me what are some of the biggest challenges in scaling up things like sustainable farms? Um, I think because, especially in, in, in Southern Africa, there is such a wide variety in terms of farming. Um, it's very difficult to find one method that works for everything. So in my region, uh, I have crop farmers, I have livestock farmers, I have mixed farming. And so what works for crop farmers might not necessarily work for um, livestock farmers or even for mixed farmers. And so that is the one challenge that um, sustainability uh, faces. But I think in terms of smallholder farmers, just trying to find methods that are cost effective um, and the use of indigenous knowledge, which really has been cost effective over the, the years, um, has built sustainability, which is why they're able to sustain the livelihoods that they have um, on farms that were manned by their parents and grandparents prior to them. So I think going large scale uh, might be a bit trickier in terms of finding sustainability, but for smallholder farmers, indigenous knowledge is definitely the way. Thank you so much, Latago. That was that was fantastic. Well done. Uh, congratulations, and thank you to the judges again for the questions. Um, you're getting an emoji clap there from Kai. So brilliant. Uh, we are going to move on, and next up we have got Yeshi, who is representing Poland. Um, Yeshi is an assistant professor at Wrocław, and that happens to be one of my favorite places. I've ever visited. I am really interested to hear this talk. Yeshi's area is architecture and I haven't heard too many FameLab talks in architecture before so I'm excited for this. Please welcome Yeshi. This is just a plain sheet of paper and this is what happens with a house when a bomb falls on it or the earth shakes beneath. 
Today, there are over 150 million people in the world who find themselves in a state of homelessness. This is more than two times the size of the UK population. But if we take this sheet of paper and manipulate it in a smart way, for example, by folding it, we can achieve new properties, creating strength from weakness. Cleverly treated paper can become excellent, available, cheap and eco-friendly material for emergency houses. I'm sure that every one of you know this dramatic situation when the last sheet of toilet paper just ripped off and what you were left with is just a rough gray cardboard tube. But if we enlarge this tube to such a size, it could carry the load of a small car. Japanese architect Shigeru Ban has used paper tubes to create houses for victims of earthquake. Thanks to his experimental approach to the material and um, humanitarian architecture, Shigeru Ban was awarded with Pritzker Prize recognized as Nobel Prize in Architecture. My team has come up with House of Cards and it has nothing common with politics or banks rubbing. In fact, it is emergency unit created uh, with the use of uh, honeycomb panels. Thanks to this structure, the panel is eight times more durable than flat elements and is also a good thermal insulator. Dutch, on the other hand, use uh, corrugated cardboard to create their house. Famous Vika house is made by wrapping layers of corrugated cardboard on a mold with the shape of a house that spins. The segments are connected to each other in order to create the whole house. The wall of Vika house is 100% biodegradable and it can last for approximately 50 years. So living in a cardboard house doesn't have to mean living in a refrigerator box. It can be nice, well-designed, beautiful, eco-friendly and safe building made of materials usually used for packaging. And what is a house if not just a bigger package? Thank you. All right, yeah, she's absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Um, one of my i think one of my first fame lab architecture talks and it was absolutely fantastic it was worth the wait um really 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 interested i'm i'm always very interested in eco housing sustainable housing um and, and using architecture in more creative ways so that was incredible um and i'm looking forward to the questions as well and i think we're going to kick things off with kai I love um, that ending she what is a house if not just a, a bigger packaging brilliant um so can I sneak in two questions? I'm gonna do it anyway, and you can see. <laughs> so my first, go for it, go for it. <laughs> my first question is, what is it about paper, um, I guess structurally or molecularly, that makes it um, so pliable and, and, and foldable and yet still durable and, and all those things? And um, it's related to my second question is, uh, how is it superior to plastic, which you can use um, devices like 3D printing for making you know, these emergency houses as well? Yeah, thank you for the question. So answering to the first one, actually the, the structure of the paper is made by hydrogen bonds created by cellulose fibers. You can imagine it, it's kind of a, if you imagine the portion of spaghetti poured on the table and left to dry, the connection between the fibers uh, create all the mechanical properties of the material. Thanks to that, you can fold it many times and they will not break. However, the water can lose the, the connections and then make the paper uh, again as a pulp. Thanks to that, you can recycle paper. It is said that you can recycle paper up to seven times, which you cannot do with plastic. Actually, all the things that are used for 3D printing, uh, they are recycled, but you can recycle it only once. So I think this is the, the superior property of the paper over the plastic. 
Thanks so much. Yes, yeah, what a what an explanation there with the spaghetti. That was fantastic. That would have been a, an incredible theme lab talk part two. Uh, brilliant. I love that. Um, and two sneaky questions there, but they're both answered brilliantly. Madeline, we are going to go to you next. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, I love the use of props during that. I think it really helped to visualize, um, you know, what you're talking about. How far off are we from seeing, you know, houses being built in mainstream with these sorts of materials? Yeah, actually, steel paper is not recognized as a building material. However, there is, for example, in the West Cleveland Sea, Southern England, uh, Westboro Primary School, which was built in 2001, and it's still in use. The main structure is made of cardboard tubes and honeycomb panels. So slowly, slowly we are getting there, but it's still on the edge between the industry and the research and the science. Brilliant, thank you, Yeshi. And finally, um, Claire was kind of sm smiling her way through that talk. Claire, do you have a question? Yeah, I've got tons actually, but I'll keep it to one. Um, I'm really fascinated by this. And how, what I really want to know is how do you make the cardboard waterproof? And you talked about it being biodegradable, but also lasting 50 years. So what happens in year 49? Is it all melting around you? <laughs> no, the thing is that um, paper can uh, biodegrade with the use of uh, germs and uh, moist water. So what the Dutch people do from the vehicle house uh, production, they keep the core of the house inside dry. And after uh, these 50 years, they can just dump it and let it be degradable naturally. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, moist and water is the biggest threat to paper. Um, but we can use different methods to uh, make it watertight. So you can paint it, you can you can cover it with, for example, uh, thermal shrinking uh, sleeves, or uh, you can use more natural materials like we did in one of our uh, experiments. We used the, uh, the wax and it, it worked pretty well. Claire, I'm delighted you asked that question because that, that is the one thing that I was wondering as well. I was like, this sounds amazing, it sounds incredible, but uh, what about the water? What about the rain? Um, so brilliant, really, really great and a fantastic talk. Yeshi, so a big thank you to you and thank you to our judges again for the question. Um, we are gonna move on to our next speaker and next up we have got Mekali. Uh, and Mekali is representing Italy and he is in his final year studying his master's in computer engineering with such a variety of topics today, it's fantastic. And he has got a big interest in the dark side of AI and its dangers. He loves explaining how computers think because he feels that knowledge is power in the fight against AI dangers. And I, I really agree with him. I love this topic so much. I'm very excited to hear about it. And he's also a big theater lover. And he has kind of realized that science plus theater basically equals science communication. So looking forward to this. Please welcome Michele. Imagine a devoundation of optics. That word I'm not speaking, but panic. And I will tell you more or less will be. If I'd ask you to tell me the biggest lie you can think of, what do you do? Let's say you have to convince me that you're an alien from another planet. Well, with a bit of imagination, you could risk making up a story of your life on your origin planet. But if I visited the same planet last year, and if I had some reference photos with me, then you'll have a hard time, a full step, a missing detail, and I'll immediately know that you're lying. However, by repeating the conversation, games will change. I will become more observant, but you, you will learn what to say and what to avoid to convince me until your invented stories will be undistinguishable from real alien stories. In practice, in order to fool me, it's enough to remember previous conversations. Well, it turns out that computers can remember things too. And you will not be surprised if I tell you that here on Earth, today, we have artificial intelligences who imagine and lie in the same way. We're talking generative adversarial networks, two networks, an inventor and an exposer. They challenge each other until the first will be able to produce plausible alien stories or pictures paintings, songs, music, 
poetry, Shakespeare works. Today, we can teach creativity to computers, asking them to lie to other computers. <laughs> okay, okay, so we only need to put two computers together and they make up things from nothing? Nope, it's not from nothing. Where did you get the information for your stories? Exactly, from my reference photos. Through those photos, those data, we transfer knowledge to a machine and feed its imagination. Do you remember the opening of my talk? It was not a meaningful sentence, but it had some famous vibes. Well, that sentence was imagined by a computer who read the provided incipits of finalists and tried to fool us, convincing that it was finalist. It tried to imitate finalist talks. Here we are. Computers are extremely good in imitation. They steal the gist of a set of texts, sounds, or images, and they use it to generate something similar. In this sense, we call them creative. Someone in the past said that is the ability to steal what makes an artist great. So whether the artist is human, alien, or artificial, maybe it's not too important anymore. Thank you. Well done. Well done, Miguel. Um, brilliant. Really, really good. Um, I love a little bit of sinister science and a little bit of dystopian uh, future telling and things like that. So that was brilliant. Really fantastic. Um, do remember to let us know in the chat how you're feeling about people's talks. And we're going we're gonna to head straight into the questions. So we're going to go to Madeline first. Madeline, what is your first question? Uh, well, that talk definitely had Fame Lab vibes. I loved that. Um, so I work in cybersecurity and artificial intelligence is, is talked about a lot in terms of how we can progress technology, but also there's the, you know, conversation about what does that, what does the impact of artificial intelligence have on us as individuals and our societies? I'd be really interested to know actually, you know, a, a positive that you see of artificial intelligence in our lives and also a negative that you think that we also need to balance as we look at how we integrate artificial intelligence. Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, artificial intelligences are good, but they're not good in the same things that we humans are good in. So we can try to cooperate with artificial intelligences and try to uh, use the uh, pro and cons of every species uh, to make up a, bit, a better world. So, for example, today we use our smartphones to remember things, uh, to tell, to communicate with others, because uh, smartphones and artificial intelligences are good in remembering things uh, and uh, building networks and something like that. But we human, we are not so good in that, and so uh, we can uh, try to cooperate in that thing, in that sense. Uh, of course, uh, artificial intelligences are really based on data, especially machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. And data today is a, a bit of a tricky, que um, a tricky topic because uh, data have to represent population if, you want, if you, we want to use artificial intelligence with the population. And someday data uh, does not represent good certain categories, especially minorities. So we need to use data in an ethical way and we need to uh, check that all data are good both in an ethical and a technical way to use it to uh, use to use them on artificial intelligences and then use artificial intelligences on people thank you so much and claire or kai does anyone have a, a, a burning desire to go to claire claire was straight in there she was even giving kai a chance um claire what is your question <laughs> I mean, this really, really scares me, this, I'm sorry. And with all of the, you know, the fake news and the false information that is out there on social media, I can see that this could be really dangerous somehow. So can you tell me, you know, if, if AI is getting so good at being able to lie, how can humans detect when the information is false? Uh, <laughs> one of the first idea that uh, scientists came up with is that another AI could detect if another AI is lying, but it's a bit delicate. Uh, however, 
uh, we can uh, uh, detect the uh, well uh, the the thing that artificial intelligence produces is not quite equal to what humans does do, and uh, so we can detect some details uh, and something that uh, tell us that this is not what uh, uh, a product of human, but it is uh, a product of artificial intelligences. And today, artificial intelligence uh, um, are quite far from uh, what we see in movies and in books. Uh, and we won't have in the next years uh, something that kill humans uh, or uh, became better than humans in intelligence. And so we can uh, we be quite mm, be quite uh, uh, relaxed about this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely fantastic. Um, we, we, we kind of got so involved with the questions there that unfortunately we're going to have to move on. Kai's going to need to keep our question for our next uh, our next participant. But I want to say a big thank you so much. Uh, Mikola, thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk. Um, brilliant. W well done. Loved that. It was really, really good. Um, and we are we are just over halfway through. Actually, remember you also get to vote for your favorite in the final. So keep thinking as you're watching this. You know who am I going to vote for? What happens to me when I'm watching Fame Lab is the first person goes and I think that's who I'm voting for. And then as each person continues, I think know that person, know that person because everybody's so good. So do kind of keep an eye make notes, decide who you want to vote for, uh, and keep supporting our participants in the chat. It's really, really nerve-wracking doing this. Tell us what you like, tell us what you find interesting. Big everybody up for us. Um, now, we are on to Hugo, who is representing Switzerland. And Hugo is currently doing his PhD in Statistical Physics and Machine Learning in Switzerland. And whenever he is not at the office, he said you can usually find him wandering around the city or on top of a mountain. Um, love it. Please welcome Hugo. Let me tell you a true story. It's the story of Lazaro Borges. Borges is one of the best pole voters in Cuba. He made it as far as to qualify for the London 2012 Olympic Games. On the day of the semi-finals, Borges takes a deep breath, then he begins to run, accelerates, plants his pole into the ground, prepares to jump, when suddenly his pole breaks. And not just cleanly into two holes, mind you, it literally snaps to more than three pieces. That was really dramatic to see, but it's explainable by physics. Physicist MVD shown that any rod-like structure, such as a pole, can never just break into only two pieces. It always breaks into at least three. And they discovered that not by sounding a pole, but something much shorter than a pole, much thinner than a pole, but it has the same physics as a pole. Namely, a spaghetti. So today I'll be telling you about the physics of breaking a spaghetti. Please do try to produce that at home. Take a spaghetti, bend it, break it, and count how many pieces you get. You always have at least three. Sounds like magic, right? Why is that? Why is it impossible to simply break a spaghetti into only two pieces? Well, let me explain. When you bend a spaghetti, you increase its curvature until you get so high and small the spaghetti can bear, and the spaghetti breaks for the first time into one, two, two pieces. But that's very far from the end of the story. There is now a free extremity that is held by neither of my hands, and that is therefore free to oscillate, thereby creating waves that propagate along my spaghetti. But my hand is still there, so these waves cannot propagate any further, and they get reflected back the other way. And there are now two waves propagating in my spaghetti, the original wave and the reflected wave. And they add up, creating even more distortion in my spaghetti. This phenomenon is known as the interference of two waves in physics. Because of interference, the curvature shoots up again in my spaghetti, causing it to break for a second time, now making it a total of one, two, three, three pieces. And that's how I get at least three pieces. But remember, this is true for any rod-like structure, not just a spaghetti. So whether you are an engineer trying to craft some carbon nanotube fibers, or maybe you are a biologist, interested in the mechanics of microtubules in human cells, or you are an industrial who wants to make an unbreakable pole for athletes like Borges. Remember, just start by cracking a spaghetti. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> very, very, very well done. Um, I can't wait to hear the questions on this. And um, also, I cannot believe that spaghetti has been name dropped now twice. I feel that like we're, I feel like we're somewhat sp 
<laughs> I thanks for the teaser, by the way. It was unexpected, but uh, I welcomed it. A hundred percent. I feel like I'm going to be going home and breaking spaghetti and trying to build a, a garage or something out of it. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to these questions. I think we will start off with Claire. Uh, do you want to kick us off? Sure, thanks Hugo, and I'm definitely going to be trying that after after <laughs> this final. Um, Good. You said an engineer might be trying to make an unbreakable pole for the pole vault. How can physics yes. help you do that? Oh, you can play on several parameters, the stiffness of the pole, the resistance to curvature. In fact, if you look at just the Wikipedia page of poles, you can see that the technology used for poles has evolved like tremendously. At the beginning, it was poles made of wood called uh, uh, which was uh, akin to olive wood, wood. Then it evolved into aluminium tubes, and now it's some very complicated uh, fiberglass with carbon fibers. And the engineers specifically tune the shape of the um, of the sheets of fiberglass and the quantity to allow for the good stiffness and the good length and the, all the good mechanical properties. So there's a huge amount of studies that goes into there to make an an uh, pole as robust as possible. Brilliant, Hugo. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to head to Kai next for the next question. Awesome talk. And I, I, I still Thank only you. see two pieces of spaghetti, though, so I am going to try this afterwards uh, to see that, <laughs> the, the third Thank piece. Um, so I guess spaghetti is not such a huge issue to have more than two pieces. Um, can you give me some examples of like very disastrous um, effects of this interference of waves in, in real life? Sure. So, for example, I think you have a background in biology. So let's take this microtubule example. Microtubules are making, as you know, the cytoskeleton of axons, which are the high roads that connect neurons. And for example, there has been studies to know when those microtubules may break after a mechanical shock, because if they do, it's some kind of brain injury. And you want to understand how the mechanical shock and the brain injury are related. And that's when you, this kind of study about the mechanical properties of microtubules can come into play help you understand the link between the two. So I hope this uh, answers your question. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, and Madeline, final question. Oh, I definitely will be trying to find a YouTube video of that pole vaulter's pole um, breaking into, into three. But um, I, I guess you spoke about the fact that in engineering, you know, that there's that there's a consideration of the physics when they're building materials. Why do you think that it's really important that engineers work with phys physicians that, who understand the kind of the structures of materials when they're when they're building new buildings or designing new places? Well, there is a whole continuous spectrum between the researcher in his lab doing mat material engineering from the chemical engineer who is synthesizing those materials and the engineers who are at the forefront of this innovation with carbon nanotubes. So, of course, I think there's already a huge synergy here. I can only speak for myself in uh, EPFL, I see it every day between startups, researchers. And so it's important to work hand in hand because to fabricate something, you need to understand what's in the material, what kind of component they are, how they interact with each other, how that affects, the, at the end of the day, the properties of a material. So, for example, if you want to craft a carbon nanotube for a space lift or for tissue engineering, you need certain mechanical properties and you need a physicist or a chemical engineer or a biologist to tell you precisely how you should do it. So I think there's a dialogue to be, that is already there and that needs to be you know, fostered as much as possible. Brilliant, Hugo. Thank you so much. And thanks to our judges for the questions there as well. Fantastic. Um, and we're going to move on. Next up, we have got Alex, who is representing the Netherlands, but who is actually Canadian. And Alex is a blogging traveling, tandem bike riding, PhD candidate. Um, by day, she studies autophagy, which is the decluttering system of the cell. And by night, she works on her science communication blog, which has possibly the best SciComm name I've heard. It is called Microbial Mondays. Uh, please welcome multitasker extraordinaire, Alex. Are you familiar with the 1979 sci-fi film, Alien? Well, if you haven't seen it, we're headed deep into spoiler country because it turns out that the plot of Alien is a great analogy for infection with the novel SARS coronavirus. Let me guide you through. So our story starts with the crew of a space vessel who land on a remote moon. Their crew member, Officer Kane, has the dubious honor of discovering alien eggs, one of which promptly hatches and attaches itself to his face. 
And there we have our first similarity, because just like the alien, coronaviruses need to first attach to our cells in order to actually infect them. But well, the alien face hugger hugs faces. SARS-CoV-2 hugs proteins on the surface of our cells, so it can then pull itself inside our cells where it will incubate. But that's not all. Both the alien and the coronavirus have more tricks up their sleeves. Let's start with the alien. So back on the spaceship, the face hugger has fallen off Officer Kane, and he seems to be fine. But we soon find out that evidently the alien emigrated from his face down to his abdomen. Now, some call the mature alien form that bursts out of Officer Kane and kills him a chest burster, but I would argue that it's better classified as a gut eruptor. And there, we have our second similarity. Because just like the alien, some viruses, including the coronavirus, can direct themselves to a sort of stomach for their own benefit. The stomach of the cell. Because just like each of us on the macro level, each of our cells needs to digest nutrients. And they do this in tiny little microstomachs called lysosomes. But now, like the alien, the coronavirus can direct itself towards these cellular stomachs, all the while hiding from immune defenses, kind of like the alien hides inside Officer Kane. And then, when it gets acidic enough, that's the cue for the virus to burst out of the cell stomach and start wreaking havoc. Now, in the film, the only options for survival depended on blocking the alien before it could ever hug your face, either by arming yourself or isolating yourself. And that kind of tracks in a world with the coronavirus where we have vaccines, masks, and quarantines. But our lab asked, what if you still get infected despite your best efforts? To address this, we turn to our knowledge of the digestive system of the cell. And to do this research, we actually grew mini human guts in the lab. We call them intestinal organoids. And using these mini guts, we could find drugs that could stop the virus from ever being able to enter gut eruptor mode in the cells that make up the human intestine. Micro meets macro again. So we're filling a gap and stopping the virus after it hugs the cell's face, but before it bursts out of the cell's stomach. In other words, we're saving Officer Kane. Well done, Alex. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> fantastic. Lovely, lovely props as well. Um, and even the language you were using, gut eruptor mode, I love that. Um, and it's very topical, of course. You know, I was, I was wondering if anyone would, would talk about COVID. Also very topical because Alien this week was named as the number one horror film worldwide. So, you know, hopefully everyone who's watching has seen it. So absolutely brilliant. I am going to go to the judges for their questions. And I'm going to kick off with Kai. <laughs> Thanks for that talk, and I have to say, really elegant alien receiving um, both times. Um, I, I'm, I'm really curious about this uh, gut eruptor blocking uh, mechanism that you described, because what's really interesting is that I would assume that it wouldn't really be affected by the new variants that are circulating, because it doesn't matter if it's already entered, right? It, you prevent it from um, erupting later. So can you just tell me a bit more about this approach that you're doing in the lab? Yeah, definitely. That's You've hit exactly on the beauty of this approach. So um, this type of drug that we're, we're looking into, they're called autophagy blockers. So autophagy is, is a, a big part of the research that I do. It's sort of the digestive system or the decluttering system of the cell. It gets rid of what the cell doesn't need anymore, including viruses. Um, but some viruses like the coronavirus sort of hijack this. The beauty of this, of using this system is that like you've hit on Kai, um, it doesn't uh, lose its efficacy if the virus evolves to have slightly different receptors. And even more cool is that this is actually not only a method that we can use to uh, hopefully treat coronavirus, but it will also work against other viruses that use the same system. Um, this project actually started out with a focus on dengue virus, and now we've taken along corona for the ride as well. Um, so we call it a host-directed therapy as opposed to a virus-directed therapy. And yeah, the beauty is it, uh, it's translatable. Fantastic, Alex. Thank you very much. And Madeline, next question. I uh, love the use of props. Slightly terrifying for somebody who hates anything alien-esque. <laughs> um, but why do you think it was important to kind of use that analogy of, of the film in explaining this topic for people that maybe, you know, this is a completely new topic for them? Yeah, good question. I actually hit on this analogy during a lab meeting. Um, 
I'm the only one in my group who works on dengue virus, which kind of does the same thing as corona in this case. And I was thinking, okay, how can I explain how dengue virus works to people who've never worked on it? Um, and it was an easily adaptable explanation for the general public for coronavirus as well. And what's quite nice about this analogy is you can take it even further because in the film, at the very beginning, um, Sigourney Weaver, the best character in the film, says, wait, we can't let Officer Kane back onto the spaceship. We have to put him in quarantine and see what happens. And classically, uh, people don't listen to her. And, you know, you can kind of see how this happens if we don't take contagious disease seriously. So I think there are a lot of uh, additional ways you can build on this analogy, which was part of why I chose it. Thank you so so much, Alex. Unfortunately, we're gonna we're gonna need to move on because uh, I need to get home to watch Alien. Um, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna move on to our next person. Claire is devastated not to get another question. Um, but we, we heard so much from Alex there, and it was absolutely fantastic. So thank you very very much. Um, and we're gonna move on to Becky. So Becky is representing the UK and Becky is a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. Um, she studies mirror coatings of gravitational wave detectors, which are basically very, very big and very, very fancy astronomical instruments. Uh, no big deal, really. Please welcome Becky. When I say I study physics, I think what often comes to people's minds is the lone scientist at their bench, you know, Galileo and his telescopes. But these days, that's not really the case. We're very firmly in the era of big science, huge budgets, large instruments, and a lot of scientists. I'm a part of the LIGO collaboration, which is made up of two incredibly large and powerful lasers and thousands of scientists. Big science doesn't always look at big things, but LIGO does. It observes black holes and supernovae, which are some of the most massive things out there. And it does this by detecting gravitational waves. So, having firmly established us in the realm of big science, I want to scale things back a bit. I'm a microscopist, I deal with very small things, and you might be wondering, what's microscopy got to do with celestial bodies? Well, one of the most important parts of LIGO's detectors are its mirrors, which bounce its lasers back and forth. My field of study? The coatings of those mirrors. Kind of like my glasses have anti-reflective and anti-scratch coatings, the mirrors have coatings that make them, well, better mirrors. Everything in your detector contributes noise to your final signal, and, simply put, noise is bad. You want to eliminate it where you can and understand its source where you can't so you can account for it when interpreting your observations. Doing this makes LIGO more sensitive so it can observe further into the universe. I want to fully understand the structure of those coatings I mentioned, because when we fully understand their structure, we can work out what noise they're producing. So, what else to do but stick the coatings in our electron microscope for a better look? Electron microscopes work by shooting electrons through your sample, and when they come out the other side, they might not be going in a straight line anymore, and they'll have less energy than they started with. This tells us what elements are in our sample, and how much of them there are. We already knew, going in, that there was argon trapped in the coatings that wasn't supposed to be there, but what I discovered was that the argon had clumped together into tiny bubbles while the coatings were being made. I could count the exact number of argon atoms in the bubbles, and a lot contained less than a hundred atoms and was smaller than a nanometer wide, so incredibly small. From that, I could calculate the bubble's densities and pressures, and other people can take those findings and work out how the bubbles affect the noise in the detector. Now, my work might sound like a ridiculously small component of LIGO, but I want to give you some perspective. LIGO was first switched on in 2002, but in 2010 it got taken offline for five years. During this time it went through a lot of upgrades, including improving the coatings. When it got switched back on, it made the first ever observation of a gravitational wave within two days, proving that the success of big science really does rely on taking care of the little things. All right, Becky, well done. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. I, I love that line at the end about, about the little things. That was just wonderful. Um, as soon as you mentioned LIGO and lasers, I just knew I was going to enjoy that talk. It was fantastic. Uh, we are going to kick off with the questions. We'll go to the judges and I think we'll start with Madeline. That was great. Thanks, Becky. You mentioned that um, the coating of the mirror has gone through lots of different iterations. How many different iterations has it gone through to get to a point where actually, you know, it, it's getting the results that, that you that you're hoping for? Uh, honestly, I couldn't tell you. I know, so that sort of 
the initial stage was before I started my PhD. Um, so I know that the, lots of different materials were tested. So the current uh, LIGO coatings of the layer that I look at was um, is titania doped tantala, um, but because that had the best properties, but there were other materials tested and different uh, like percentage of dopants, so more titania. Um, so it really was like an iterative process, like comparing lots of different ones just to see which uh, gave the best results. But I can't, I don't know what the exact number was. Uh, it was quite a lengthy process. <laughs> Thank you, Becky and Claire. Can we can we go to you? Yeah, thanks, Becky. That was great. And it's really good to be reminded that science is about collaboration. It's about lots of people working on different bits, not just one kind of lone scientist. I think that's a really important aspect of science. Um, and you explained really clearly, I think, how something small makes a difference. Um, and, and you talked about the gravitational waves um, being the discovery of that, being a result of it. Can you tell me how I can explain to my next door neighbour why gravitational waves are important? Sure, so um, gravitational waves was first postulated by Einstein back at the beginning of the 20th century and it took a hundred and a bit years for them to finally like discover one, to observe one. Um, but they're important because they tell us stuff about the universe that we can't get in different ways. So gravitational waves let us look at things that you can't see with traditional astronomy, uh, so black holes for example, and they also tell us about the beginning of the universe um, because you can't use that uh, like normal astronomy to look at just after the Big Bang, um, and so it might be hard for a, someone who's not super into to science to understand you know in their day-to-day -day life why that's important, but for like the pursuit of knowledge, which I think is an important goal in and of itself, um, uh, gravitational waves are really important because they are a way of doing things that we couldn't do otherwise. Perfect. Thank you so much, Becky. A lovely explanation of that. And we are just going to finish off your questions, Becky, by going to Kai. Thanks for the talk, Becky. That was really, really interesting and, and I think really challenged my brain juices. <laughs> um, so you mentioned electron microscopes and, and from memory, um, their lenses are a bit different, right? They're like electromagnetic lenses. So just wondering, could you just explain um, simply, how do you actually coat an electromagnetic lens? So um, the coatings that I were talking about were for LIGO. So they were the, the coatings on like an actual mirror. Um, electromagnetic lenses on a physical thing um, they don't have coatings because they're just a magnetic field that like, because electrons have charge, so they're affected by a magnetic field. So the stronger the magnetic field is, like the more they'll be deflected. Um, so yeah, you don't coat them because they're not a physical thing. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Um, a, a very, a very beautiful uh, description of gravitational waves, which is not something that I, I think I've ever said before. Um, so thank you very, very much, Becky, and well done to you. We are going to move on to our next participant. And next up, we've got Adam, who's representing Hungary. And Adam is a PhD student in Budapest. He is an evolutionary biologist, but he likes to think of himself as an astrobiologist. I, like, I just think that's the coolest term ever. Um, his main area of research is the origin of life on Earth. So this ties in quite well. Um, I really can't wait to hear this. And please welcome Astro Adam. I brought you my favorite bacteria. They led to one of the greatest breakthroughs of biology and also had a huge impact in our everyday life. There was a great struggle in genetics. Even with high-tech tools to study a specific DNA, you need billions of copies of it. And you know, it's hard to meet a dinosaur in the living flesh just to get the right amount, and you'll also have difficulties butchering the dozens of pandas in a blending machine to uncover their genetics that's highly unethical. And if you want to test this way, whether I have the brand new data variant or not, just get away from me. But what if we took just a small amount of DNA and somehow photocopy them until we have the right amount. Technically that's possible with a catch. To copy DNA reasonably rapidly, you'll need extremely hot steps around the boiling point of water and for a long time there was no molecular tool that could withstand this kind of heat. But here's the solution. It's called Thermos aquaticus, a marvelous microbe coming from the fuming geysers of the Yellowstone National Park. There's a reason I store this bacteria in a thermos. 
They only enjoy life around 80 degrees Celsius. Every part of this bacteria has adapted to this hellish, boiling, jacuzzi-like environment. But these parts include an enzyme that excels at copying DNA. This heat-adapted enzyme led us to open Pandora's box of genetics. Paternity test, forensic science. Do you want to see behind the genetics of cancer or you just want to know how near they are you? Hmm? Or maybe considering the pandemic, can I offer you a COVID-19 test? Because all these questions start with the DNA enrichment method offered by these bacteria and their enzymes. But wait, there is also a lesson to be learned here. Just this February, a rover called Perseverance landed on Mars. Primary mission to look for possible signs of life in an extreme environment very different from Earth. The project cost around $2 billion, that's only 1% of Elon Musk. Still, many question whether such research can be of any actual use. However, the discovery of the Thermos Aquaticus started just the same way. Someone was just looking for possible signs of life in an extreme environment very different from Earth. It was a geyser. But this resulted in a $30 billion business not to mention an invaluable wealth of knowledge. That is why one must boldly go where no research has gone before. Thank you. All right, Adam, well done, absolutely fantastic. Um, I love that, I, I, loved, I loved some of your, your, your uses of language, photocopic DNA and everything, and, and your, your bacteria in a thermos. Like, I feel like I probably wouldn't accept a cup of tea from you, but um, it was really, really interesting. And it's such a simple, brilliant prop as well. Um, so we're gonna kick off the questions. Uh, and I think we're gonna start with Claire this time. Thanks, thanks Adam, that was great. Um, you talked about your favourite bacteria, and this being one that loves really, really hot temperatures. Um, are there any bacteria which love extremely cold temperatures? What do we know about them? And could they be the ones that are living in, in some of these, uh, in the moon that we heard about earlier? That's a great question. I'm a I'm, I'm member of the team Enceladus myself as well. So yeah, it's a good question whether we know of any bacteria. Yeah, they are, they are a number of them. They are called psychrophilic uh, bacteria or, or microbes, but our research and our, our domain of knowledge is, is more blurry on this subject because, yeah, thermophilic organisms are, are were the number one prior, prior, priority for some time. But uh, going to Antarctica and cold places is, is less of a, are, are less inviting places, I guess, for, for microbiologists because, yeah, it's nice to have a research in the Yellowstone uh, National Park, but, but spending half a year in, in one of the, on one of the poles of Earth is, is less intriguing, I think. Thank you so much. Um, Madeline, what about you? I thought that was great. Again, definitely not accepting anything out of a flask from you, um, Adam. <laughs> but you um, you talked a lot about the, the kind of cost that is, go, goes into this sort of research. Um, some people would say that's a huge amount of money for this sort of research. But why do you think it's really important that we understand you know where life has come from and that and that journey to how we've got to where we are now yeah that's the thing because we we will never know what what the result the results will be after such a research i mean again consider the thermos aquaticus we we had no idea what solution uh, might might come after the the discovery of of such a bacteria and still we, we had this, this wonderful new method called polymerase chain reaction. So, so uh, that, that was the main reason I, I chose this topic and this subject, because it's very hard to, to convince, convince an, an investor to, to invest in a, in a very fundamental research. But again, there are high risks, but also the, the rewards are, are you, can't, you can't estimate that. Oh, but... Thank you so much. And last but not least, Adam, we are going to go to Kai for a question. Great talk, Adam. I mean, like the PCR is such a revolutionary technique, right? And 
it's it's basically the main difference between genetics and and protein studies you can't make more copies of protein to study them so that's a, a huge limitation um can you give me uh, another example of where there is a discovery in microbes that revolutionized genetics um, once again well uh, another interesting microbe might be deinococcus radioturans it's a, it's a microbe that that is able to resist very high levels of radiation so it might come it, it might come as a handy organism like studying the effects of, of interstellar radiation or or how how one can how one can tolerate such high levels of radiations but yeah that's the only bacteria and I am I'm, I'm aware of that that in the close future might be useful for us Thank you so much, Adam, and thanks to the judges for the questions. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. And just like that, we are on to our very, very last participant. And finally, we have got Boshidar, who is representing Bulgaria. Uh, Boshidar, or Dr. Bo, as he's called, is an assistant professor in chemistry in Sofia. And his research focuses on functional nanomaterials for photocatalysis and energy conversion. In his spare time, he is a gadget builder, i.e. he's just super cool. Please welcome Dr. Bo. Okay, guys, when I woke up today, I saw this oddly bright November sun shining through my windows and it really, really annoyed me because then I realized how dirty my windows were and the chore I hate the most is cleaning windows. I'm sure that you do too. Fortunately, stay calm, I'm here to help because I'm a PhD in self-cleaning surfaces. Well, my friends were mocking me that I'm just a high-tech window cleaner, but I wear this with pride. Especially nowadays, we all see the outside only to the windows of our homes. So, to find out how to make them self-cleaning and leave this thing in history, first we need to know what makes them dirty. According to chemistry, we have two types of molecules. These are the polar and non-polar ones. The polar molecules, they're easy peasy, they dissolve in water, we need no detergent, we can simply wait for the rain. The real V1 in the story are the non-polar molecules. These are the suits and the oils from the city traffic, the greasy fingerprints and all fatty acids. For example, the stearic acid. I was using this in my experiment. It has a long hydrophobic tail, it likes to stick to surfaces and it doesn't play well with water at all. If you try it to scrub an oily surface with water, you know it makes it even worse. You need detergent and elbow grease. Fortunately, self-cleaning windows they can manage only with water. They are made from ordinary glass, but we add a thin layer of titanium dioxide on top. This material has two superpowers. First, it is super hydrophilic, it attracts water more than oil, so water will sneak under the oily spots and they go down with the flow. Easy peasy, right? No, but we have a problem. Water evaporates, oil cannot. Fortunately, titanium dioxide has another ace up its sleeves. It is photocatalytic, it can use energy from light to drive chemical reactions. So we need no water at all, we only need ultraviolet light. When we activate the self-cleaning coating with it, some of the electrons will go to higher energy level. If we have an evil molecule like stearic acid nearby, then what follows is charge transfers, photooxidation, photoreduction and chemical transformation, but this can be explained very simply like this. We repeat this a few times and any evil molecule will be chopped down to water and carbon dioxide. So we can enjoy the view, which in my case, it's a Soviet-style panel building, but anyway, guys, in the end, self-cleaning coatings, they're not something new. They were invented 50 years ago in Japan, and the first application was in self-cleaning toilets. Anyway, root for science, guys. We take care of your number one problems, and sometimes even number two. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Very, very good.
Do you know, I was a little, I was a little concerned. You know, the closer that we got to the end, people might run out of energy because we're, we're at a long event. But Bo just entirely disproved that. Um, very, very energetic, very exciting, really, really funny, and great props as well. Um, don't forget to let us know in the in the chat what you thought of everyone so far. Uh, that was just fantastic. I want to go to our judges. And I saw all of them laugh out loud during that, and I am going to go to Kai first. <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious, Bo, and actually really interesting as well. So um, amazing job. Um, so many questions. I'm wondering, can I get this to work for like plastic containers, which I hate washing when they've got any oil in them, but clearly that's not what you're talking about. So <laughs> um, with regards to the UV that you mentioned, is UV from sunlight sufficient um, to do the self-cleaning mechanism or does it require special UV lamps? And in that case, how safe is it? Yeah, well, the ultraviolet light from sunlight, it's only 3% from the spectrum, but fortunately these self-cleaning coatings, they can work with very low light levels. Uh, they use them very often in Japan and they found that in hospitals, even the UV light you get from LED lights, which is microvolts per square centimeters, it's like thousand times less than the sunlight, is enough. It works slowly, but over the time it works uh, efficient enough. So we don't need any special illumination. Thank you so, so much. Um, and next up, Claire, we're gonna go to you. Thanks, Bo, that was brilliant. And I hate cleaning windows, so I'm really glad that this is on the horizon. And um, what I was wondering though, was are there other applications for this? This titanium dioxide sounds amazing. Can it be used for kind of other waste management if you have surplus oil in, in other industries, for example? Yes, well, there are lots and lots of applications. Actually what my PhD was about was how to use these coatings to clean the air indoors because with time you get different chemicals, different contaminants in the air and you get like headaches and you get tired. They call this the sick building syndrome. So uh, there are already commercial um, coatings like commercial self-cleaning windows that can almost do this but the ones that we developed in Sweden where I did my PhD they're much better. So uh, yeah, if you want to know more about it, you can read my PhD thesis, sadly I cannot see what it is. Uh, but there are many, many other applications. Last week I won a, a research funding to uh, study how to use such coatings to split water, which is also something, uh, because if you split water you can get hydrogen and oxygen, so that's also something that a lot of people do. But pretty much any type of application where you can use sunlight to drive chemical reactions can be done with photocatalysis, so that's the idea. Thank you so much, Bo. Um, and we are going to go to Madeline for the final question of today's semi-final. Go for it, Madeline. Thanks, that was great, Bo. I don't envy any window cleaners that watch this and think that they might they might be out of a job. Um, but are you now seeing that kind of bu buildings that would typically have had window cleaners, are they replacing the, the, the glass to... Um, have this self to their self cleaning, or is it now that actually it's only being applied to new buildings? Well, actually, there are a few types of commercial self cleaning glass which are offered by the two major uh, manufacturers of uh, architectural glass. So it's not something new. Uh, the idea is that sometimes these coatings they will not be re resilient enough to survive in the outdoors. So more work should be done. I, I, this means that if you want to use them in your building, you should make sure that it's not in an environment that will damage the coating itself. So that's one of the problems. Uh, but yeah, in general, I think that there should be a, at least buildings from the maybe early notice that already use this. It really depends where they are. So. Once again, it's not something new. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Bo. Thank you so much, Bo, and thank you to the judges for our wonderful questions. Thank you, fantastic. Uh, and there we have it. We had 11 wonderful participants with 11 excellent, exciting talks. And it's over to you now. The voting is now open. I want you to follow the link on screen and in the chat. We need you to select your top three and we need you to rank them. So put your favorite as number one, uh, your next favorite as number two, and so on. Please pick three, your three faves. Uh, and we want you to tune in tomorrow at the same time 
for the next semi-final. And we are going to see you on the 16th of November to find out who are in our final 10 for the grand final. I'm so excited, I cannot wait. And I want to say a big thank you to our judges. They've, they've had a really difficult job. Thank you to all of the organisers. Thank you to the brilliant participants. And thank you to everyone at home for tuning in. My name is Emer Maguire. I want to thank you for joining us. But for now, go and vote for your favourite. We are going to leave you with a bit of a reminder. Bye everyone.